Thank you very much. Uh, it's a tremendous treat for me to be here. Normally, we speak only to academics uh, who have no power and very little influence. Uh, but you folks are the ones who actually do something with the law. And I want to try to lay out a little bit of background uh, on this problem of third party financing and pose for you the choice uh, that you're going to be able to make. Um, I'll start with the basics. And the basics are essentially the tremendous centrality uh, of law in America. Uh, it was John Adams who said that what we have is a government of laws, not men. And he put that in the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780. Uh, we have in this country, as you know, uh, no aristocracy, no monarchy, and no established church. For us, uh, as uh, that man, Tocqueville, said, uh, law is a vulgar tongue, meaning everybody speaks it, everybody thinks about it. Uh, but the big question for America is, uh, what's the content of that law? Um, law students learn, most of the public doesn't really understand, that the English common law is still the basis uh, of American law, but only insofar as it was applicable to America. That's uh, John Winthrop, the famous uh, governor of Massachusetts. And in probably the most important, I'm going to call it early constitution, the Massachusetts Body of Liberties in 1641, there was a provision that said uh, it's the right of every citizen with a grievance to have some court adjudicate it. And that's the start of the extraordinarily lit litigious nature uh, of America. But in that document and in that era, the focus was on individuals injured by government or other individuals. And the idea was simply to fix something that had gone wrong for that particular individual. Now, part of that system was a system that some of you uh, remember called common law pleading. And there's Sir William Blackstone, uh, the great expositor of the English common law. In that system, Causes of action were clearly defined, and each cause of action had a designated writ that would begin proceedings. And again, as you'll remember, some of us were taught about the system, each one of those writs, each one of those proceedings had particular complicated pleadings that were to be filed as the proceedings were contested and litigated. Uh, just as in the 1641 Massachusetts Laws and Liberties, it was a maxim that for every wrong there was a remedy at law. But the truth was that there were a myriad of matters that simply were outside the common law, court, and writ system. Acts of God, inevitable accidents, sickness, death, and many other matters simply did not give rise to private causes of action. Indeed, uh, the American common law doctrines that evolved for this country uh, were designed to promote the activities of active individuals and to limit their liability on the theory that we all benefited if enterprise thrived. And that was the story of the development of the law in the 19th century as told by many uh, legal historians. And indeed, to underscore the point, if one's case did not fit into the narrow definitions of trespass, trespass on the case, trover, replevin, assumpsit, or the rest, one was simply out of luck. Let me make the point uh, again as clearly as I can. The purpose of these 19th century uh, common law doctrines that flourished well into the 20th uh, were essentially to encourage investment in a capital scarce economy. Indeed, there was a feeling that by doing that, we'd spread the wealth, to use a phrase that I'm gonna come back to, by encouraging productivity. It was, I think, a democratic goal uh, of the law. This uh, era, and again, you'll be familiar with it, uh, was characterized by standards rather than strict rules, by encouraging common sense, by standards applied by judges, by you people, and not generally by juries. And a big part of that 19th century uh, series of developments and of the English common law was the notion that one ought to discourage litigation. Discourage litigation. Let me say a little bit more about that. And again, you can turn to Blackstone for more on this. Until the middle of the 20th century, a view prevailed that a litigious society, as Blackstone explained, was a perniciously fractured society. Blackstone 
indicated that common law pleading and the 19th century common law doctrines were part of that, as were in particular the old common law doctrines of champerty and maintenance that punished lawyers who actively promoted litigation. Blackstone railed against those who promoted litigation, calling them, quote, I love this, the pests of civil society that are perpetually endeavoring to disturb the repose of their neighbors and officiously interfering in other men's quarrels. And let me just uh, beat this horse just a little bit more. The greatest figures uh, of the law in the 19th century, even people like uh, Abraham Lincoln, who gave a law lecture that was recorded by his uh, secretaries, but oddly enough, uh, was never, as far as I know, published. Lincoln said, we should discourage litigation. You should persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can. Point out to them how the nominal winner is often a real loser in fees, expenses, and in waste of time. He went further. Never stir up litigation, he said. A worse man can scarcely be found than one who does this. A moral tone ought to be infused into the profession which should drive such men, that is, those who encourage litigation, out of it. But you know that things changed, and things changed dramatically. By the middle of the 20th century, all of this had changed. Common law pleading was replaced by code pleading. This opened wide uh, the door to litigation of all kinds of different kinds. A culture of individual achievement, self-sacrifice, and religious obligation was being replaced by a culture of group entitlement and redistribution by regulation or by litigation. New private law doctrines emerge, spawned by a legal culture that favored regulation over acquiescence and redistribution over laissez-faire. You're familiar uh, with the features of that culture. Strict products liability, unconscionability, OSHA, implied obligations of landlords, and many, many more. Indeed, a new model emerged, and that new model owed a lot to that man, Earl Warren. Litigation is good. It vindicates rights of the oppressed. We should encourage it. Class actions, discovery, fee shifting, and lots of other features uh, of this new culture emerged. Now, there are still profound divisions over the acceptability of this new model, this new, let's call it litigation happy model. And what's really interesting today is that our political parties are quite divided over the issue. The trial bar influences the Democrats, perhaps to a greater extent than the Republicans, and industry and defendants influence Republicans to a fairly great extent. But I think what's going on here really is a deeper divide over the nature of law and legal practice, and you are right at the crux of that. Indeed, with regard to this issue of third-party financing of litigation, our states are profoundly divided. I want to look at just two of them very briefly, and I've explored this in a longer paper that uh, I can easily forward to any of you, and it's on the Searle uh, website. For example, the great state of Texas. In Texas, Texas makes it clear that it is behind third-party financing of litigation. It ignores Blackstone and Champerty and maintenance. It says, this is not a public policy problem. No one is preyed upon. There isn't control uh, by interfering third parties. And indeed, third party financing by financing worthy causes encourages settlement. There is an interesting decision uh, in Ohio that takes precisely the opposite position, that third party financing discourages litigation. I'm sorry, discourages settlement. The Blackstone got it exactly right. The champerty and maintenance still uh, ought to be deferred to and that a lawsuit is not and should not be an investment vehicle. Intriguingly enough, that Ohio decision has been partially overturned by statute allowing third party financing of at least some causes. Now what I think is at stake here uh, is nothing less uh, than the rule of law itself and what's going to happen to it. Third party financiers, it is said, will only finance worthy cases. But what if? What if uh, the kinds of suit? What if the sort of things that we want to enforce authority for? What if the kinds of suits that third party financiers don't want to bring? For example, jury trials 
or torts are indeed the ones that maybe ought to be encouraged, just a possibility. Let's ask again, what exactly is the purpose of a lawsuit? Why do we allow them? What are we trying to do? Is a lawsuit, uh, as Barack Obama likes to say, about spreading the wealth, but not spreading the wealth the way the 19th century did by encouraging lots of different productive enterprises, but rather shifting wealth from one group to another? Where indeed does the logic of the Brown case really lead? Where does Earl Warren's jurisprudence take us? We have to ask, should we be encouraging financing of at least some lawsuits in order to redress grievances? Well, let's think about this. Let's think about the implications. If third-party financing really is worthy, might it then suggest that lawsuit financing is actually a right? And if that's the case, if lawsuit financing is actually a right, shouldn't we have a public option <coughs> for financing lawsuits? How about a single-payer system? Sooner or later, maybe all lawyers ought to be controlled by the government. You see the analogy uh, that I'm drawing. Or could it be that maybe Champerty and Maintenance and Blackstone were right and we ought to be discouraging third-party financing? Okay? Those are the choices. You're the judges. You get to decide. And that's all that I have to say about it at this point. Thank you. <laughs>